will to use. Um, last but not least, uh, Ben, you have the floor. Thank you. So I was asked to speak about the beneficial applications of quantum computing for international security and our Center of Excellence for National Security looks at a wide range of issues including cybersecurity and the use of technology in security issues. So I'm going to focus on one particular part of uh, what quantum technology is being used for and I think all who were interested in quantum were in the tech track just now, right? Do I need to go through? I'll just speak very, very, very briefly, and if you have any technical questions, I'm always happy to channel them to Patrick. <laughs> so classical digital computers, they work with bits that are either on or off, and there's zillions of these transistors in your mobile phone, that's a technical term. They work step by step, and you need lots of them to model complex questions like chemistry, biology, and uh, why is it raining, why is it not raining? So an 8-bit computer can store 2 to the power of 8, <clears throat> which is 256, trust me, I did the math, states of data. Whereas a quantum computer, they use a qubits, which can be 1 or 0 or anything in between. So when somebody asked me today, can you explain quantum uh, physics easily? I said, yes and no. <laughs> and they work in parallel faster. And they are naturally suited to model complex questions because of this. So if you have 8 qubits, I, somehow the math works out to 10 to the power of 77, which is 10 followed by 77 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. It's more than on the I could fit on this screen. So, quantum supremacy is the great topic that we talk about. Okay, so it is not what you saw in Avengers that they use it to travel through time. It's just that when quantum computers can surpass classical digital computers, because right now, as Patrick was saying, right now his uh, quantum computer, which is at IBM, which they make available on the cloud so that all of you, you and I, can also use a quantum computer. Right, right now, after this session, you can go and sign up and you could run your algorithms on a quantum computer too, right, Patrick? Yes, any one of you could run a quantum, well, if you wrote one. Uh, some people say it will be in five years' time. And Patrick, I like the way you said it. Um, if, you are being, uh, if you are the engineer being asked, you'll say it's ready, it'll be ready in 50 years. If you're in sales and marketing, you say it's ready in five to 10. So that's how you get your venture capital funding. And there's competition. There's competition, the biggest US and China. And um, Elsa was talking, explained a lot about the different nuances. The US is better at some things, China is better at some things. There are patents being filed and as an ex-intellectual property lawyer I say that the patents also show only one part of it because there are patents filed and then there's stuff which they don't file patents for because it's really secret and then their patents get, they get stolen but that's another story. But besides the governments there's also the big companies Google, IBM, Microsoft and uh, there's also this small country, Singapore, I have to give a shout out to. Uh, and it's very relevant that Google and IBM, are, the private sector is actually a very big player in this because it is not just governments that are driving the show in terms of quantum. And in fact, it's not governments that are driving the the, the biggest development because when you say the USA, we're not talking about the US government, we're talking about US companies. Whereas in China, the difference is not there, perhaps. So what are we doing in Singapore? Um, uh, shameless plug, right? We're using quantum algorithms to crunch numbers on commodities pricing, social networks and chemical structures and find correlations. So. Um, so that this uh, gentleman will no longer need to use the entire wall to write his equation. Uh, and also to use quantum to store computer models of a city's traffic flow or neural firing in the brain. So we are turning our whole nation, it's not that big, it's an island, so we're turning into a smart city, so it becomes a smart nation, so we'll need to store a lot of data, so that's important to us. So this then brings me to one specific question, which I've had ever since there was this incident where Apple went up against FBI, or rather FBI went up against Apple. And some years ago, there was a shooting in San Bernardino. 
and an iPhone was found and the FBI wanted to get into the iPhone and then they found it was locked and they couldn't get in and this started off a whole uh, debate about unbreakable encryption or for and against and this was very relevant because um, in the work that we do at the Center of Excellence for National Security we want to uh, talk about intelligent technological policies but we also many of our stakeholders are also in law enforcement and counter-terrorism and for them uh, they have a, a different view of this so on the technology company side supporting unbreakable encryption that's the Apple side unbreakable encryption meaning you can keep your messages so secret that nobody can get in it's important because it protects your banking transaction from criminals criminals can't get into your transactions it can also protect the privacy of citizens whistleblowers dissidents it's a human rights question and it is always said by the technical community that if there are back doors meaning a secret way in for law enforcement or government to get in then criminals can get that back door too and of course some will also say sometimes in some countries the law enforcement and the government are the criminals on the other hand my prosecutor friends are totally aghast by the idea that there could be unbreakable encryption because to them it says they say it protects criminals from investigation it prevents citizens from assessing information and there must be another way so many governments have said isn't there a technical solution go and solve it you're so smart right you're so smart people uh, somebody like Ray Ozzy he actually suggested a very complex way of doing escrow which means that the key the backdoor key would be kept securely uh, he's been highly criticized by the people on the left side of the uh, column uh, but that question has bugged me for years is there another way that we could balance this need and so that brings us then what does this have to do with quantum well the power of quantum computing is you can do things like use algorithms to de enhance detection of cancerous tumors and also this supposedly allegedly almost all current encryption the if you're using the RSA type could be broken by quantum computing by 2025 or maybe 2035 or maybe 2045 or maybe 2055 <laughs> someday or it could be stolen now and decrypted later uh, which which actually is a very important part regardless of when because right now everything that we think is safe may not be safe later uh, if you've ever heard of this thing called anonymizing your data it used to be that we thought that we would be safe because when data was stored they took away our names yay take away the name but you leave all the other information about you for example your your gender your age your occupation and soon you triangulate to your location where you stay there's only one person that fits that they don't need your name so this is part of this long tail of security or lack of security that everything that we think is safe now could be unsafe later and that's why we need to care about it now or find a way to get over it later so what were the problems that had that were faced you know that um, if there is a possibility that all current the encryption could be broken well one use case was there was a bank that needed to protect customer banking data and it's actually a Swiss bank so I'm in the right place to talk about it they went from the bank servers they want to transfer data to the data recovery center so in that at arrow part that's where cyber criminals could strike use case two: a government that wanted to protect the counted votes data happens to be Geneva I'm also in the right place to discuss this anybody who's been involved in this please do speak up later I'd love to talk to you from the central ballot counting station the counted votes data needs to be sent to the government data center and so along the way there was make sure that the the integrity of the 
data is protected so you don't get the wrong vote numbers. And the use case three, smart factories that need to protect intellectual property. An automobile manufacturer has designed documents that need to be sent to their IoT, their robots in the factory, and they don't want anybody to steal the car designs. So how do you solve all this if the current cryptography can be broken? Quantum key distribution, because it will not be compromised by any increase in computing power. This is because of the physics. The physics indicates that, and the math indicates that, no matter how powerful the future computer gets, if you use quantum key distribution to share your key, you won't compromise it. So in the red part, you make sure that there's quantum key distribution. You use quantum to give the sender and the recipient. The sender is always called Alice and the recipient is always called Bob. It's A and B. Okay? So Alice gets the quantum key and Bob gets the quantum key. And by magic, not by magic, it's actually quantum. Uh, why is it working? Because the number is truly random. That key is truly random. You can't solve it mathematically because it just is. The key can be changed constantly and you can't eavesdrop without perturbation. So, or getting the photons perturbed. Now, you don't want to perturb your photons right? because when photons are perturbed, your message is messed up. Is that right, Patrick? Is that accurate thing? <laughs> Yeah, so you'll know some if somebody's eavesdropping on your photons, you'll be able to see it because your message comes up messed up, and then say, "Oh, somebody is trying to break into my message, and so I won't send it now. I'm going to send again, send again." Okay, finally, when nobody's messing with my photons, then I will send. Then you know you're safe. So that makes me ask this question, which I end you with. Is there a way to protect data until it needs to be accessed for national security reasons? Or are we just ending up with an even more unbreakable encryption, which, yes, is great for all the reasons that we saw, but also not so great for all the other reasons that we saw? Or does the nature of it mean that we could actually have a form of encryption which is secure, until it needs to be unsecure. And of course, this is a very complex question because there are challenges like scale, distance, cost, procedures that need to be put in place. One of the biggest criticisms of securing this is that the cryptography actually is the technical thing that needs to be solved, it's the people that are the problem. So if I were law enforcement, what I do is I wouldn't try and break the cryptography, I try and break the fingers of the guy who has the key. Then you get the key. So I leave you this question and thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, never perturb the photons. That's kind of a key takeaway for me. Um, we now have about uh, 10 minutes or so uh, to open the floor for any questions that you may have for any of our uh, experts. I see one hand, I may try to, co to collect a couple before uh, starting the answers. I see one hand, is there anybody else that has a question or an observation? Two and three, okay, perfect. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you all to all the speakers for their very interesting presentations. I have uh, two questions, um, one to uh, Ms. Martika and one for uh, Dr. Ang. Um, to Ms. Martika, you're, you're aiming at what, 8,000 years for storage. Are you also looking at different ways of storing information, say actual storage like in glass or, or DNA or so using any kind of difference like other than magnetic storage. Um, and my question to uh, Dr. Ang would be, um, many, many times uh, when we, we look at different um, ways of having more and more secure uh, encryption, um, we see that it's way, way easier to attack the implementation. And with quantum key distribution, that is actually the case. 
So uh, it, is, it is still um, another way, more secure, of course, due to the fact that you cannot photocopy quantum states. Um, it's a way to distribute information in a very secure way, but you can attack the, the whole infrastructure. So, and there are a number of attacks, you're certainly aware of that. Um, what can we do about this? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Diego Latella from the Italian National Research Council. Well, to a certain extent, the first question was kind of anticipated my question. But anyway, I I'll put it anyway to Ms. Martica. Uh, in your plans for th this project, uh, uh, where you think uh, you should use blockchain for uh, keeping this information for 100 or maybe 1,000 years. Uh, is there room in the project uh, for planning uh, maintenance of the system? I mean, blockchain, as far, I'm not an expert in blockchain, but as far as I know, it's running in normal computers nowadays. And the lifetime of computer systems is uh, terribly short. So you have to change them to maintain them uh, and so on. So what's the part of your project which is already devoted in planning this kind of activity? So maintenance and upgrading and so on. Thank you. Um. This is working, yeah. I just had a remark to Dr. Ank who said that to mention the escrow mechanisms where basically when, um, when need be, someone could actually recover the key of, um, or actually be able to reveal some information that would normally not be the case. And he mentioned that there were actually concerns about it, but uh, I just wanted to precise that in certain cases, the escrow mechanism can only be used if there's if there are enough people who agree that it should be used. So it wouldn't be like a unilateral, uh, unilateral decision by just one party, by just the FBI, but one could think of, for instance, having a different organization of judges or law enforcement that in these cases may actually require uh, this escrow mechanism to be put in place. So um, I think it's still a viable solution. It's still a sensible solution, especially in the case, like you mentioned, between Apple and the FBI. And I don't think it should be directly discarded as a solution. And I had a question for Ms. Morsica when she mentioned that, uh, um, I'm not sure I understood correctly, but uh, I thought you mentioned that you didn't want any uh, encryption and that uh, there could be issues with different versions uh, of, uh, of your files. But then the second part of, you, of your presentation was about the distributed ledger technologies, which I, of which the goal is really to make sure that there is only one version of the story and that this uh, version is completely um, th and, th and that there is some integrity in this data. And on the other hand, you may also still keep some anonymity even with distributed ledger technology. So I didn't really understand how it fits with your first part of the talk where you mentioned not wanting any security at all uh, in a sense just to be able to access the data. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll close it for now. Let's give our speakers an opportunity to, uh, to reply. You know, you win three to one. So please, why don't you uh, start? Thank you. Very, very good questions. I think that I can manage to answer uh, questions one and two uh, in the same time. And uh, it was about have we, have we checked any other solutions than, than blockchain? No, we have not, because we, we were, we were uh, for a year ago, we were still trusting about the existing system. We have a state system which is digitally side and uh, prepared for our purposes for three years ago. It is quite modern system. But then states have, uh, have the other responsibility. We have to report to the IEA and the European Commission. And that's the, that's the problem in, or challenge in, uh, in, uh, in this kind of very long-term long issue and uh, nowadays because this is new and we are the first in the world and and we are generating the data for the next generations everybody are very interested in that we can get generate this data and this data and we can store this but nobody has been thinking that how we can do that that's the problem and uh, and now we have we have uh, we have learned a little bit about blockchain and we noticed that, okay, this is, this is very good. We will, uh, we will make this blockchain in practice study and we will check if this is work with us. So we haven't checked any, any other than this traditional what we have existing already now. But we know that, that, that some member states who will have the same kind of uh, 
same kind of challenges than we. They are they are preparing totally different things, but not digitally sized. They are they are preparing the paper, which uh, which will be uh, uh, with with is able to use for thousand years and some kind of uh, uh, some kind of ink that uh, it will. Uh, uh, stay for a thousand years or something like that. But okay, we are just in the beginning. I hope that we still have time to prepare the study and then to then to prepare the challenge. And uh, the other question, it it is almost uh, uh, almost the same. And uh, did I answer that? <laughs> almost, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, almost. <laughs> yeah, and uh, about this en encryption, um, the the problem is mainly that uh, the the, the uh, uh, conflict between the security and safeguards. Safeguards is based on the international agreements, and uh, security is the national one. And usually, with the with the encryption systems, they are the national requirements. And in Finland, they are very high. And for example, the international organizations like the IAEA, they are using the comprehensive one which is fulfilling almost all the member states, but they are lower than ours. And so we don't have the common system that we can encrypt the data and send it. That, that's the main problem. I'm not an expert on that, but usually we are struggling that we don't have the right key and you don't have the the right format, and this format is not fulfilling our national security security issues. So uh, I want to thank Patrick for the support for the escrow because I think that's also a very um, good way of reaching that balance between the encryption and not. Um, and I do also recognize that one of the criticisms was actually related to the first question, which is the parts of the parts which are not the actual technology itself, the implementation. And, uh, and in many ways, that's a perennial problem for all kinds of cybersecurity. The weakest link is the distance between, is the thing between the two ears. That's the one that's going to be the easiest thing to, to hack, so to speak. And that is something that has to be um, training, education, uh, building systems that are going to take account of user failure to try and reduce the disasters that people can uh, incur by themselves. And one of the problems also is that the, it, the uh, encryption, not every nation is, the same, is equal when it comes to the use of encryption because if we want to talk about should the encryption be available, the back door, the key be available and protected by rule of law, like say uh, through a warrant or through the justice system. In my region, there are countries with uh, perhaps not great record of rule of law. So should they have the back door key? And that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I wish I could keep the floor open for uh, more questions. I have actually a page full of questions myself, but I'm afraid that um, due to the time we are um, uh, forced to bring this session to a close. And this has clearly been an enlightening and in a way heart lifting session because it has provided us all with a clear understanding of some of the practical benefits that, that such technologies uh, can bring to international security and disarmament issues. I have certainly learned a lot and I hope that you feel the same. Uh, on behalf of UNIDIR, I'd like to extend a special thanks to our panelists and our experts, uh, Quentin, Alejandro, Elena and Ben, for sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, please join me for a round of applause to our experts. And I would like